Hello, I'm Dan Sweeney, the Director of the Institute for Enterprise Ethics at the Daniels College of Business here on the University of Denver campus. This is the third of a series of interviews we've been doing with selected faculty members from the Daniels College of Business and friends of the Institute on topics of current interest in the arena of enterprise ethics. The topic for today is the state of business ethics in the financial services industry. We're conducting this discussion in late September of 2012. And looking back on the past summer, it's been quite an exciting experience for the financial services industry during this season. First, we continue to hear about massive amounts of client funds that have apparently gone missing in firms such as MF Global and Peregrine Funds. Then in June, Barclays settled for $453 million for rigging the globally important LIBOR lending rate starting sometime in 2005. And then we discovered that Barclays was only one of 16 firms on three continents that participated in this rate fixing scheme. In July, HSBC Holdings was accused of facilitating widespread international money laundering and possibly terrorism financing transactions as well. In August, UBS was in and out of the courts dealing with accusations of tax fraud conspiracy, money laundering, LIBOR rate rating, and municipal bond derivative bid rating. On August 18th, Phil Angelides, the former California State Treasurer and former chairman of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, in a Huffington Post article, quoted a June 2012 survey of 500 financial executives in the United States and Great Britain saying 24% of these executives believed that financial services professionals may, may need to engage in illegal or unethical practices in order to succeed. 26% said they had observed or had first-hand knowledge of wrongdoing in the workplace and 16% said they would engage in insider trading if they thought they could get away with it. So what is it about this financial services industry that brings about such frequent and egregious behavior? To try to shed some light on this question, the Institute for Enterprise Ethics has invited two experienced professionals to discuss some of these specific issues. Kevin O'Brien is an associate professor and the chair of the Daniels College of Business, Business Ethics and Legal Studies Department. Professor O'Brien is an attorney, holds a CPA certificate, and was an IRS revenue agent. He has had wide experience in civil and cr criminal investigations and has published and lectured extensively on professional ethics. Kevin, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. John Van Heuvelen is an independent director of two publicly traded corporations and former CEO of Life Vantage Corporation. Mr. Van Heuvelen served in executive positions in various Morgan Stanley Mutual Fund, Unit Investment Trust, and Municipal Bond Divisions. From 1993 to 1999, he served as president of Morgan Stanley Dean Witter Trust Company. John. Welcome to Daniels, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. So, gentlemen, let's get on with the questions. So, Kevin, what is the trouble with the financial services industry? Why does such a high proportion of the scandals we read about tend to come out of this, this particular industry? Could it be as simple as the Willie Sutton response when asked why he robbed banks? Because that's where the money is? Well, I believe that's the case. And uh, when you feel that uh, as an industry, you're just too big to fail and you can take exorbitant risks. And at the same time, if you have losses, you ask society to go ahead and bail you out. It's sending a message, uh, not only to the executives, but also the professionals, those uh, engaged in the financial instruments. Uh, the message is fairly simple, that you are free to go ahead and uh, do whatever you can to make as 
much money as possible for the business entity. And when you do this, the executives, uh, stock options, uh, will be worth so much more. Uh, and at the same time, then the executives are sending this, this message to uh, their professional employees, uh, go to the limit, push, push everything that you're doing, every process, so that it maximizes profits. That is so seductive for a 25-year-old, fresh, uh, freshly minted out of uh, an MBA program with maybe a degree in, in finance. And it's a heady experience to realize that in five or six years, based on the bonuses that you could earn, uh, you can retire by the age of 30. And so consequently, there is this uh, institutional um, executive compensation and professional compensation that is telling everyone there's a green light. There's a green light to actually bend the rules to the extent that uh, will maximize profits and we won't worry about the future. These companies uh, were finally recognized as being um, in a difficult situation. And, and the one example is Goldman Sachs. Uh, Greg Smith, a VP of Goldman Sachs, amazingly uh, left the firm and then sent a letter to the New York Times and simply stated that the company had lost its way, that it had no longer viewed customers and clients as being the primary focus. They come first, no, it's the need to make money and, and frankly that the clients are basically suckers and to be used. And so consequently I think that once those firms lost their way to this extent because of the money, uh, that's why we had a lot of these problems. John, how does it look from your view? Possibly a little different. Uh, um, I think that there are obviously have been some bad actors in this in this industry, and uh, I would say percentage-wise, it's it's small. Um, but I would agree with with Kevin that uh, in the Goldman Sachs case, that is uh, an egregious. Uh, way to look at things. I mean, uh, in my years uh, in the business, it was always the customer first. And uh, I think the whole issue of proprietary trading is, is not new in the last 10 years, but has grown to be very important and has, has now been abused. So uh, I can't disagree with uh, with uh, the example that you use, and but I would say that the bulk of the people in the industry are uh, trying to do the right thing, and there are there are some uh, rogue people out there that are going to be seduced, as you say, by some of the compensation practices. Let me put this in a little different context. Over the past couple of decades, as these institutions became more and more global and the number of global transactions in increased to massive amounts in trillions of dollars. Uh, this created a, a, a huge amount of liquid assets in the system, which just appeared to be there for the taking. And so the temptation was just too large to ignore. How do you re react to that idea? Either one. Uh, do you have... Uh, the only thing I would say that here recently there's been a uh, very low interest rate environment and so participants have been chasing yield and uh, I think in some part that led up to the subprime uh, crisis as people were uh, chasing yield and doing whatever they could. I also think there is a tremendous amount of leverage that was instituted in the system. And uh, even though the crisis happened in 2008, we're still deleveraging now. Uh, homeowners that are uh, underwater on their mortgages are still deleveraging. And deleveraging, I said at the time in 2008, would likely take 10 years. So. Um, I think we're right on track with that. Yeah, and another example is, is that the industry got into a practice just to maximize uh, you know, the, the profits. It was all contingent as far as 
uh, getting more borrowers to borrow money for mortgages for houses that they probably couldn't afford, subprime mortgages. And uh, it got so bad that uh, they were called liar's loans. In other words, you didn't have to uh, uh, verify or you know, provide any evidence that you were even employed. In Ohio, there were several instances where the actual uh, applicant uh, turned out to be dead in several instances. Uh, so there was just a total focus on just getting people to, to borrow the money and, and what's the risk because you're going to pass on the risks uh, to the ultimate purchaser of those securities. They're going to be uh, AAA rated uh, and so uh, theoretically no one's harmed. Whole, all of society and, and, the, and the government was basically saying it's a good thing for people to own houses. Uh, but then uh, the industry, from my vantage point, took that uh, uh, to, a, to the extent that it really created problems with, uh, with our uh, financial condition as a, as a nation and indeed the world. Good, thanks. So John, you worked in this industry quite a long time. Um, and you know that it hasn't always been this way. Uh, we can remember when bankers used to be some of the most trusted professionals in our town. So what happened? Well, I think it's a good question, uh, Dan. Um, I would cite maybe three or four examples. Uh, one, I would say that uh, the small town commercial banker, let's say here in Denver or Fort Collins or Colorado Springs, is probably still the most one of the most respected people in, in, the, in the town. Um, what has happened, however, is that there have been, has been an explosion of uh, huge organizations, huge commercial banks and huge investment banks, such that those institutions probably control 80% of the trillions of dollars of deposits and the small community banks probably control closer to 20%. So that's a change that's happened in the lifetime that I've spent in this industry. Um, I would also say that uh, when I started in the business in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, given my age here, uh, most of these organizations were private. Uh, they, they didn't have a they had a corporate structure, but they were not publicly held, if you will. And now almost all of the big banks, commercial banks, are all, of course, publicly held and, and enormous institutions. Probably the 10 biggest commercial banks are control 80% of the deposits. Same way with the big uh, 10 investment banks, probably the same way. Uh, so the community banks are still probably still privately held and those people are still probably going about business much as they've always done, gathering deposits, taking savings accounts, having safe deposit box and, and good local customer service. I would say some of the problems have, have emanated because of the large leverage that these big institutions have taken and the fact that it's become global in nature. Um, and then I would say the other big change that's happened in my lifetime in the industry is that we used to be all client focused and there wasn't really anything like proprietary trading. That didn't really come about until maybe the mid 80s when, when uh, investment banks were starting to trade for their own account. And that's led to some abuses, I, I would think. And we talked about some of those, Kevin, in the mm -hmm. last segment. Kevin, you've educated a lot of business school students over the years. Could it be that there's some kind of an ethical flaw in the characters of students? There's some efficiency in the ethical education of the students who are attracted to the financial services industries? Uh, I, I think that's true, that there, there could be a flaw with the education. There has been uh, increasingly 
over time in business education to focus on what uh, Aristotle would call external goods, uh, fame and fortune, uh, you know, try to maximize pri uh, profits for, for shareholders. And when you have that singular perspective about uh, profits, uh, you could run into these ethical lapses. And what we tried to do at Daniels is to really look at uh, what Aristotle also said, that uh, what really motivates you, what gets you out of the bed every morning. And it's not those external goods of fame and fortune, but uh, what makes you excellent as a professional. And we, we work with our students so that they understand that uh, they should be focused the, on clients coming first, not their own um, money or bonuses that they're going to uh, actually earn. Uh, those will naturally follow if you are, are doing an excellent job. Uh, but I think that, that really is a mindset that uh, has settled in in academia and uh, many schools are trying to combat that, to have, have that other approach from an Aristotelian standpoint. And so then we also uh, you know, describe how, how good people can do bad things at times. And I think that's essentially what you have. But we mentioned previously about how seductive all of this money uh, was. And, and they've, they've done a number of studies scientifically that when you play a game and have subjects, that when money's involved, the part of the brain that's activated is the same part uh, when you ingest uh, cocaine. And so it's terribly addictive. And so we see um, some habits develop uh, by both the executives and the, uh, uh, the younger professionals uh, where they start engaging in conduct that they see is tolerated uh, that might be unethical and then it just snowballs from there. For example, uh, the movie Insider depicted uh, how in many instances of these companies we had executives at the highest level all the way to the lowest levels uh, where the professionals used uh, prostitutes uh, and then wrote it off as a copying expense. And to me, that's just like embezzling, taking the uh, company's money, but if that's tolerated, then almost anything is tolerated, even though it could be a small amount compared to the billions of dollars involved. So John, you've seen uh, young people come into this industry over a, you know, a fairly long period of time. What's, what's your view on that question? Well, I think young people need to think about uh, a mentor system and training. They need to focus on the fact when they get SEC training at their firms, they need to listen to it very carefully and, and focus on it. Uh, mentors were always a very important part of my career. And you want to have people that are a little older, have been around the block, are going to coach you, if you will. There's a lot of coaching mentality in, on Wall Street and, and in the big banks where you are showing the way to do the right thing. And uh, I think there has to be more ethics training. I, I reflect back in my undergraduate years and, and we didn't ever have an ethics uh, course that I recall. And uh, now uh, those are being offered more and more and more but as Kevin says, it's, it's, not, it's obviously not sinking in enough if you've got that kind of an example going on. Again, I signed lots of uh, expense reports, and I guess I, <laughs> I don't recall any copying expense, but uh, <laughs> maybe it was there. Uh, but again, you have to lead by example, and, and that kind of thing just can't be tolerated. Good. Thanks. Very good advice. So John, the uh, financial services industry is sort of infamous uh, for its very high compensation levels and compensation structures. Could it be that this behavior that we've been talking about is, a, is a, some function of this transaction-based, bonus-driven compensation system used in the financial services industry? Dan, I think it could be in, in certain instances, in uh, certain parts of the industry. Um, I think in the investment banking side, when they're putting together uh, programs that are supposed to fail, like in the Goldman Sachs example, um, 
goodness sakes, uh, he, he, the reason for putting that together was not disclosed. And, and uh, you have to really wonder why someone would do that unless it was for compensation or from some ego driven uh, aspect of, of his life. So um, I, I think that there is a, a move afoot to drive the compensation more towards the ownership like the shareholder has. Uh, give the clawback provisions so that if an individual's performance or a team's performance or the company's performance is egregious and, and bad that the that the company can claw back that that money and I'm seeing a lot more stock based compensation I think Kevin and I discussed that before we went on camera and and you're seeing not so much in the stock option uh, area but more in uh, restricted stock grants that vest over a period of time and that if the stock doesn't perform that the individual is going to suffer and uh, hopefully that will uh, drive some performance. How does it look from your vantage point, Kevin? Well, related to compensation, uh, that can be quite, again, uh, seductive, is the, the whole issue that uh, you could have policies, which we see in the industry, where one out of five would have to be fired at the end of that time period. So you could either make millions or you could be fired here again, this is terrific, putting terrific pressure uh, on uh, employees to really perform well and sometimes bend the rules. Good, thanks. Good insights. Recently, Bart Chilton, a member of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, said, and I'll quote here, Barclays is just one example of why we need a culture shift in the financial world. And that means all the way to the top, end of quote. John, is there something in the culture of the dominant firms in this industry that encourages or at least enables th these kinds of unethical behaviors? Well, Dan, I would unfortunately have to say, yes, it appears so. Uh, there appears to be a lack of moral capital or moral relativism. Uh, secondly, I think there is a lack of concern for fiduciary responsibility. Uh, I think there's a very aggressive one man for himself sort of attitude. And uh, I think when that happens, uh, you're going to get real problems. I, I'm reminded of the quote that John Bogle gave us here recently, the, chairman of Vanguard Mutual Funds, who said that the dollars have outweighed the standards of traditional professional conduct. And when that happens, there is a lack of trust among the counterparties. And if you think about that, that played a big part in the financial meltdown. Uh, so self-interest and how it looks in the newspaper headlines that's kind of gone away. And uh, you've seen all sorts of things. You mentioned MF Global where you had self-interest and an inability to say that the trades were probably too leveraged. They put too much money at risk in too risky of an investment. And uh, then someone evidently tried to cover it up because the money is missing. Um, Peregrine Financial, I mean, you've got a fraud that has gone on for 20 years of somebody not mailing the uh, statements out to customers, mailing them to himself. I mean, these, these sorts of things just can't happen. Kevin, what do you think? Is, is it a cultural issue, you believe? I, I really do believe that the tone at the top, the culture that is set by the leaders of the company are just critical. And that's why I think search committees for the, the new CEO should be looking at a, a very important characteristic from that leader. Someone that can not only make ethical decisions uh, correctly, but at the same time actually model that behavior uh, with all of its um, employees within the company. And when that is done, then, then it, 
the employees really don't believe that the company is hypocritical um, by actually trying to force everybody to go ahead and, and try to make as much money as possible. That what will truly be rewarded is long-term thinking by that employee, not only to make profits, but to do it ethically. Uh, what happens is that when you always think so short term, and if the executive is preaching that, that only the next quarter matters, uh, then, then that's why we have a problem with the corporate culture. And under the federal sentencing guidelines, the, the company gets a deal with the government, a better deal if they can show that they do have a tone at the top where they have ethical leadership and they don't have the stresses that we've been discussing today inside their company. Thank you. Good insights. There's been a lot of regulation in the financial services industry over the past decade or so, and a lot more is being proposed. Kevin, do you think there's any relationship between the kind of unethical, egregious behavior we've been discussing that has occurred over the past decade or so, and this pattern of regulation or maybe lack of regulation that has been visited on the industry? I think we can really point to the the lack of regulation. And what I mean by that is that uh, whenever we break rules in life, uh, we have to think that there's consequences. And if there's no one to enforce the rule breakers, then we, we actually promote more breaking of the rules. And I think that's what's happened uh, with the SEC over uh, the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, when there has been a uh, transgression uh, a violation of SEC rules relating to the investment banking industry. No one went to jail. Uh, there was only a fine uh, that was um, the sanction, and the company didn't even have to admit uh, that there was even any wrongdoing, that they just paid the fine. So there's no accountability. And so I think uh, because of that, there is, there is a real concern that there isn't an enforcer and even if you have an enforcer that's present, you know, are they adequately funded enough so that they can make a difference? John, how does it look to you? I might come at it from the uh, a little different uh, angle, uh, that being, let's say, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, 2002. I would argue that although that may have been heavy-handed and very expensive to institute in the beginning, I think it has had some beneficial aspects to it. Um, now it's been very expensive to implement, uh, but the internal controls, I would argue, have been very positive. Uh, I think the Dodd-Frank legislation and the regulation that's going to come out of that is uh, more uh, questionable for me only because many of the regulations haven't been written yet. And uh, I know commercial bankers complain to me uh, and also investment bankers complain to me that those regulations are very late in coming and, and are taking up an awful lot of time. So I think it's too early to say what that is all about. But I would say that for smaller companies, whether it's Sarbanes-Oxley or Dodd-Frank, that smaller companies probably ought to be exempted from some of that because we're not seeing really the small companies being the bad actors here, it's more of the larger companies. So uh, that would be my take on regulation. And I would agree that the SEC has received a fair amount of, uh, of uh, more funding, but probably not enough. Good, excellent points, thanks. Kevin, uh, following up on this issue of regulation, uh, there, have, there has been recently a lot of regulation. The financial services industry has always been very heavily regulated. Could it be that there is so much regulation that people are taking their cues only from the law and not from any sense of ethics or moral responsibility? So the law is simply um, not just the floor, but maybe the ceiling of their behavior now. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a real problem if that's the perception that when you look at the regulations uh, that they are the, the minimum standards, but there are a number of unethical activities that are not covered by regulation. 
And uh, what's unfortunate is that we see time and time again, when you have regulations, then they're gained. Uh, and so you violate an overall principle of those regulations. And it was very interesting that uh, with Enron, those traders traded and everything they did was legal, but completely unethical to actually move electricity out of the state of uh, California and gain the pricing of electricity. It's just that the regulations just hadn't caught up yet. Now we have the Energy Act a couple years later that basically made it a five-year prison term for doing those same acts. And I think you could apply that as well to the financial industry. John, what do you think of this issue of legality versus, versus uh, ethics? Good question. When I talk to young people about it, uh, what I try to uh, use is, a, is an example of a basketball player standing at the free throw line. And we all know that the toe should not go over the line. But uh, if you're tempted to lean over as far as you can uh, to the basket, uh, is that uh, correct? Well, you know, I guess that's probably right. But it, it use, I use it to emphasize the fact that if it doesn't feel exactly right to you, what you're doing, uh, even though there might not be anything in the employee handbook that says this is not right, uh, you know, ask somebody about it. Uh, you know, use that mentor. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the example I try to use. Good. And, right. and if you always go to what the law demands and you're in the habit of doing that uh, day in, day out, it's very easy to slip across that line if you're always trying to get up to the line of illegality, but still being legal, that you won't be indicted that day. Good. Yeah. Thanks. So we've talked about the um, financial service companies, we've talked about their executives, we've talked about government regulations. There's another party out there, non-governmental um, organizations that participate in this in this industry as well, uh, such as rating agencies. So, Kevin, do you think that there's a um, some culpability in the, in the non in these non-governmental operators as well? I think that they they do have to uh, look at themselves and say maybe we are partly responsible for what happened with the Great Recession, and um, there are two. Uh, professions and particularly the uh, accounting profession was able to in the 90s actually uh, remove a lot of uh, legal liability exposure for their financial statements uh, and those were hard-fought victories so now they view that maybe their opinion they're not going to be held vicariously liable if they blow an audit uh, and uh, not a single accounting firm had any difficulty with the valuation of these uh, mortgage-backed securities in which uh, substantial portions were worthless. Um, and then I also fault the, um, the uh, rating agencies. And there's a real tie-in with the accounting firms. Accounting firms after Sarbanes-Oxley could not do both the audit that the financial statements were consistent uh, with uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, the rating agencies also go ahead and rate uh, the financial instruments. So they're very, very similar, but accounting firms cannot do consulting. Um, it's a conflict of interest. Uh, what we found uh, was a real conflict of interest with the rating agencies. Historically, what they would do would be to charge 40,000 to rate a corporate bond. And it wasn't contingent on the rating. Uh, they could give it a bad rating, they would still get paid. The financial industry rearranged their their agreement with the rating agencies and saying, we'll give you $250,000 if you go ahead and rate it AAA. But if you don't rate it AAA, you get nothing. This is alleged in CalPERS lawsuit, uh, the Employees uh, Retirement Fund in California. And uh, they allege that that was a clear conflict of interest when the rating agencies uh, would only get paid this large amount, if and only if, they uh, rated it AAA. An accounting firm could never um, uh, be under that arrangement that they'd only get paid if they gave it an unqualified opinion on its financial statements. Wouldn't you think it would be a conflict of interest uh, simply because 
uh, the rate agency is being paid by the institution that's promoting the bond rather than an institution that's considering buying the bond. Isn't that an inherent conflict? Yes, and it's the same uh, problem that we have uh, with the company you know, paying for the accounting services for the opinion. Right. And there's been historically through the decades uh, some other options uh, that maybe publicly traded companies would pay a fee that would then pay for, you know, to the SEC to pay for, mm -hmm. uh, for those opinions. But yes, there's a real problem when you have that built-in conflict of interest between the payor and the rating agency or yeah. the accounting firm. John, anything to add here? No, I would agree. Um, uh, you saw the rating agencies charge for those, as Kevin said, uh, uh, way back when. And I can remember thinking that was odd. I wasn't aware until right now that uh, they could dramatically increase their uh, profits if they rated it on a positive, on a triple A basis. But uh, it took them quite a while, I agree with Kevin, to uh, catch up with what the world was seeing in prime rate uh, or in uh, prime, uh, subprime uh, mortgages, excuse me. And uh, they finally did catch up. Uh, the accounting firms, uh, what has come out of it is the PCAOB, which is now overseeing accounting firms. I think it's uh, way too early to see if that's going to help or not, but uh, uh, I, don't, I don't find as much uh, problem with the accounting firms. Um, goodness sakes, when Enron happened, uh, Arthur Anderson was completely put out of business, and so uh, there was a definite pain there that happened. So I have no doubt about that. Right. Good. Thanks, fellas. So, gentlemen, we've covered a lot of territory here, and we've talked about a lot of issues and problems and challenges. So, um, what, if anything, do you think can be done or should be done to kind of rein in this industry? Kevin, what do you think? Well, first on compensation, I believe that the executives, as mandated by the chairman of the, I mean, of the, of the board of directors, that they should set aside some of their compensation uh, so that in trust, if it turns out that later decisions were made that uh, hurt the company, that the company could get some of that compensation back. Uh, because it could mean a failure not to look long term and just focus uh, just on the short term. The other um, thing to do, I believe, is to fund the SEC with enough enforcement personnel. They are getting thousands of good uh, whistleblowing reports within uh, companies, but it's very, very hard to um, have the investigators investigate all those reports. Um, they really need to bring some, a couple of high-profile cases that could result in a criminal uh, prosecution. I think that's going to be important uh, as we go forward because if that happens, it's not just the company's going to have to pay a fine without admitting liability that people could actually go to jail. Good. John, what do you think? A couple of thoughts. I would uh, make the derivatives and credit default swaps, I would make that a public, uh, not a public policy, but I would make sure that everybody could see those transactions. I think that would help. Uh, Glass-Steagall, there's lots of talk of, of reinstituting Glass-Steagall. Uh, Kevin and I talked about that earlier. I think I might do that, but on an updated basis. Uh, in other words, you can still have a proprietary trading operation, but maybe it would be a separate entity uh, that could be spun off to shareholders if shareholders wanted to be in that sort of activity. Uh, so I think there are some other things that we've learned that we have sort of forgotten, and I would like to see more education. I would like to see more discussions like this so that we can actually recall back to 2008 and have a discussion of what went wrong. It doesn't seem like we have enough of that. We did early on at the National Association of Corporate Directors, we talked a lot about that. Securitizations, I think, have some problems. If you are underwater on your mortgage and you're going to fail, you can't find out now who really owns your mortgage and you can't negotiate. And I think that is just uh, crazy. 
And I think the federal statutes that I mentioned earlier, and, and you mentioned, Kevin, as well, on, on fraud and, and what is the standard of proving that is, is going to help once we get those kinds of things in place. Uh, so those would be my thoughts. Well, I would agree with those thoughts, and, and I would uh, like to uh, uh, extend one of the observations you made that maybe through uh, conversations like this among the three of us, we can encourage other people in the industry, people who are concerned about these kinds of behaviors and trends, not only in the financial services industry, uh, but in, but in w wider ranges of enterprises as well, to, um, to stand up for a point of view and take a position, a public position, and, uh, and let the world know uh, well, what these standards ought to be and how we ought to get there. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we've enjoyed bringing this conversation with you and look forward to the next uh, opportunity we have to share a faculty interview from Daniels College of Business with you.